All right, so as we continue our notes here uh, in Chemistry 30, this is Material Science B notes. Uh, we began talking about hybrid orbitals here last time, and we're going to continue from where we left off. So we talked about carbon, and normally the electrons in carbon, it's number six there, normally there's two uh, electrons in the 1s, and then there's two electrons in these three degenerate uh, p orbitals. And so that's not an ideal uh, situation. And I'll tell you why. Because we would have something like this normally. We'd have two electrons, so one here and one here in the s orbital. And then we would have um, one here and then one here, right? Four valence electrons, and this is how they would be occupied. The trouble is, is this. Literally, these two electrons, okay, they're, they're bunking together. They're, they got a bunk bed there. They're in this tiny little room together. And there's definitely room for them, but one of the electrons says, hey, listen, there's, a, there's an empty room over here that's just not too far away. I wonder if I could just pop over, over here. And so it kind of wants to get away from its neighbor if there's a space available. And so in this sort of, and again, I just this is a bit of an electron story, but in this situation, what would happen is this electron would kind of boost up here, and then these orbitals would sort of melt together. And, and so the basis, uh, the bottom line is, hybrid orbitals often form when there becomes a situation where all orbitals uh, can be half-filled. And so this is the situation right here. And in that, really, these orbitals kind of mush together. And as we saw in those videos and things, that how, how orbitals are not like classrooms, where students come in, they're more like regions of space that can kind of morph and mush and, and, and move around a little bit. And so these electrons are evenly spaced in hybrid orbitals. And that says 4sp with an exponent 3. 4sp3. So sp3 orbital. All right. And it forms a tetrahedral shape. All of these orbitals uh, fan out into 3D space completely evenly. And here you have how the electrons uh, work, okay? So those are hybrid orbitals. The tetrahedral geometry is the shape with a central atom and four uh, elements there bonding, like would be for CH4. Okay, any questions about that? That's where we left off yesterday. Okay, so more complex hybridization accounts for double and triple bonds as well. So as you can imagine, we have um, Sort of more complex things happening when bonds um, change, the nature of bonds change. So single bonds are called sigma bonds, and this is the lowercase Greek letter sigma. Uh, you've maybe seen that before. Um, standard deviation in math is represented by lowercase sigma. Uppercase sigma is the summation sort of symbol. Okay. Double bonds, double bonds, those are bonds involving four electrons, are called pi bonds. And you know a lot about pi from math as well. So sigma bonds and pi bonds, we'll probably mostly refer to them just as single and double bonds. And we'll look, uh, we'll, we'll draw some pictures and we'll kind of see um, how that happens a little bit here. So, everybody get that there? Right. Now, we've learned, we learned yesterday in le yesterday's lesson about you know single bonds versus double bonds. So this is what we're talking about. It would determine how many hydrogens are involved here, right? So just structurally and spatially, it might look something like this. And I want to go back here now to Lewis dot structures, OK? So Lewis dot structures. So let's take a look at how these double bonds can be understood. So if we had um, a molecule CH2O and we were to d draw a Lewis dot structure, so remember the Lewis dots have the valence electrons, those are the ones involved in bonding. Um, so we would have a carbon here, we would have an oxygen, and we would have uh, two hydrogens. So hydrogen up here, hydrogen over here. Okay, so the electron dot, you might think that between hydrogen and carbon, there's one single bond. Okay, that's great. Uh, that would be that would be a great, uh, great guess, because hydrogen can only form one bond. Um, you might think that there's a bond between carbon and oxygen, and that's great. And then oxygen would have some more electrons that would not be involved in bonding. 
So this might be your guess for a Lewis dot structure, which would involve, if we were to draw this out, you know, just instead of the dots, if we were to draw this out with bonds, it would kind of look like this, right? That's what it looked like. And we wouldn't really draw the, the loose, unpaired, unbonded electrons. We wouldn't really account for those. But here's the problem, and you can kind of see it maybe a little bit better in this uh, structural diagram, that carbon here only has three bonds, and it doesn't have any extra electrons here. So we have a problem here with the octet rule. Remember the octet rule says that, that um, um, atoms want to have a full octet of electrons around them to be sort of in their, their, their resting uh, ground state. And so we kind of view it like this. Oxygen is cool here. Oxygen is fine. It has eight electrons surrounding it. That's okay. Hydrogen has a full, well, it's not an octet because it, it doesn't have enough electrons to fill eight. It only has one. So it has two electrons, which would fill the one S. It's happy. Okay, no problem. But carbon here only has six electrons immediately surrounding it. So this is a case where the electron dot structure would lead you to um, say, okay, there, there might be a difference in the bonding here. So this is how it's drawn, actually, for this one, okay? So we would have, between carbon and oxygen, there would be a double bond. And you might think, okay, how does that solve a problem? Does it not look like both oxygen and carbon are unhappy without their full octet? But no, actually, when these uh, electrons are in this double bond, they are now shared by both uh, elements. And so uh, oxygen has two, four, six, eight, okay? Those four are all grouped and sort of belong, in a sense, to oxygen. And for carbon, two, four, six, eight. So carbon's happy now, too. So this is how it actually looks. So we have carbon uh, bonded to two hydrogens, according to the formula doubly bonded to oxygen, okay? So everything's accounted for, octet rule is satisfied. So this is the, the proper Lewis dot structure for CH2O, okay? Sorry? Well, is it a double covalent bond? Yeah, they're, they're sharing the electrons, so technically, yeah, sure, it would be a covalent bond. Now, this is technically really called a pi bond, right? It's a double bond, it's a pi bond, pi. These other bonds would be the sigma bonds, right? Well, that's terrible. Sigma bonds. That's not so good either. But anyways, sigma, okay? Yeah. Okay, any questions about that? That just gives you a hint on how maybe it's determined whether there should be a single or double bond. The, uh, the octet rule does play a part. Okay, so benzene, um, on page 770 in your Glencoe text, Pause for a second to double, double check to make sure we're good there. 770. And this appears to be in chapter, let's see, 21. Hydrocarbon isomers. Okay, yeah, benzene. They start to talk about benzene here on page 770, 771. So let's talk about benzene. Benzene is a, it's a special... Um, aromatic compound, okay? It's a special kind of a uh, circular compound, and it's a hydrocarbon. The uh, benzene ring uh, is, uh, has a formula of C6H6. I'll zoom in just a little bit there so you can see that. C6H6, which means that each carbon is attached only to um, other carbons and a hydrogen, okay? So let's just pause for a second and just explore this diagram here. This is kind of strange, and a lot of this is, it will be new for you, but these double lines here, so here would be a double line between these two carbons. There's a double line and a double line there. Those represent double bonds, okay? Now, this arrow back and forth, notice how these double bonds have actually flipped to the, now to the odd carbon, uh, the odd spaces or whatever, from you know what I mean? These, these are representing now double bonds between different carbon atoms. And so this double arrow means that really in real life, the double single bond combination actually, in a sense, it flips back and forth, you know, uh, in such a quick amount of time that really it mushes together and forms a special kind of 
uh, bond here. And so instead of having double bond, single bond alternating, we have this sort of shared uh, double bond between all the carbons. And so that's why you have this um, you know, uh, hexa hexagonal shape for the six carbons. And then you have a circle in between here. So this is benzene. It's, it's found in a lot of uh, compounds. It's used in, in the industry a lot. It's a functional group all on its own, which we'll learn about later. Um, but benzene is uh, uh, a structure that's very common and very important in, in organic chemistry. All right, so there are some questions from the textbook that I'll get you to do to cover the uh, notes here so far. We're going to keep going in this lecture here. We'll come back to these questions in your textbook. So in your notes, you should have uh, this next section, isomers, on page 765. So in your textbook as well, we'll go back a few pages where it starts to talk about isomers. And that's what we'll focus on here next. So two or more substances with the same molecular formula but different structures is the definition for an isomer, okay? Don't confuse this with isotope, okay? An isotope are two of the same uh, atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. That's isotope. So iso is kind of the same or within itself a little bit, right? So isomer is two or more substances that have the same molecular formula but they have different structures, okay? Now, the structures that can be different, okay, are simply sometimes the way you draw them, okay? Positional or structural isomers. One of the examples would be a positional isomer. So what is a positional isomer? Well, butene is an example. I mentioned this last class, actually, that there's two different ways really to... Um, there's two different um, versions of butene, okay? I think this was the exact example I used last day. But take a look at this. If we have one double bond in butene, okay, one double bond, this double bond could show up in two different spots between the, if we were to count these carbons from left to right, okay, the double bond could be between two and three, the second and third carbon. So that would be right in the middle there, the middle spot of the three bond positions. But also, the bond, the double bond could be between carbon one and two. So this represents positional isomers, and usually it refers to positions of double bonds. Okay? Now, you may or may not see this, but there is no possibility for there to be a three butene. Can anyone tell me why? Why does 3-butene not exist? Can anyone see why we would, we would not have a 3-butene? It's the same as 1? Okay, why? Okay, so we have to remember, thank you, we have to remember that these are three-dimensional molecules, right? Okay, three-dimensional molecules. Now, I'm going to, uh, oh, I can't show this on the video. But if I hold my hand up to you right now, the way you're looking at my hand, my wedding ring is on the, my one, two, three, fourth finger, fourth finger from the left, if you count thumb, index, middle ring, right? The fourth finger. If I flip my hand around and you count from the left, my ring is now magically on the second finger. See that? But it's the same hand, I just flipped it around. Okay? So you, and my you, can, you can see this, but envision that, right? If you count from your thumb, one, two, three, four, your ring finger is the fourth finger. If you flip your hand around and count from your pinky, still on the left, or on the left now, it's on the second finger. So that's why three butene would be the exact same as one butene. So we wouldn't need to do that. So if I were to really just flip this thing around in space, I would have CH3 singly bonded to CH2, doubly bonded to, uh, whoops, another single bond, sorry, we're butene, CH2, and then doubly bonded to another CH2. So this 3-butene is really the same as 1-butene because it can be flipped around. Okay, you got that? Viewing this three-dimensionally is really important. If you take your pencil and you look at it, 
If you're an eraser, if you have an eraser on the end, if it's on the left, you flip it around, now it's on the right, still the same pencil. The eraser has not been removed and stuck to the other end at all. Okay? But there definitely is a difference between one and two. Okay, hope, hopefully you understand. You have a question. I'm just like, you're just really confused. Yeah, like, like, why, like, what's Okay, so again, what is one butene and what's two butene? One butene, this one would indicate the bond position for the ene part. So the one and the ene are connected. One is the bond position where the ene or the double bond would exist. These are bond positions. I'll write these in, in red, okay? Or no, I'll write them in blue. So here is number one bond position. That's between the first two carbons. Here's number two bond position, and here's number three bond position. Oops, number three, okay? So this one right here refers to the position where this double bond is. It's in the first bond position. The two butene, two, would reference the second bond position because in butene there are three bond positions. So the two is going to go with the in part, it's going to show you where the double bond is. Okay? Is that clear up? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about, about that? Yep. Okay, good point. This two here that I just erased, that should not be there. Thank you for that. Yes. Because each carbon should have four bonds. Uh, here's one, uh, here's another one with the H, and here's two more, so that's four. Each of them should have four. One, two, three, four. And so on. So yeah, that two there should not have been there. I was focused on the bond positions, but yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> when an atom or different or atoms different from hydrogen or carbon are introduced to the organic molecule, the new part is called a functional group. This is very important. We're going to be talking a lot about functional groups. So. So far, we've only been talking about carbons and hydrogens and bonds and circle, you know, chains and circles. But now we're talking about what happens if other, other uh, elements are now introduced. Well, if we have a group, an element or a group of elements that's now attached to a carbon chain or ring, then we have something called a functional group. Right? Question? You can't see the green there. Okay. Not from back here? Okay, I'll see if I can change it here. I don't think I can, but I'll see. Okay, so this is one propanol. That's what this is. For those of you that can't see in the back, I'll outline this. One propanol. Now, what does this mean? Well, remember, the number has to mean, uh, has to refer to something to do with this molecule. And here, it's not so much the bond, but it's the this part, the all part. So that tells us that we have a function. And we'll talk a lot more about this. This is just an example. Okay, the all means that we have an alcohol group. And an alcohol group is simply an OH attached to some carbon. Okay, so we have C bonded to C, bonded to C, bonded to an OH functional group here. Okay, and then we do have, these are all hydrogens. I won't write all the H's there, but they're there. Okay, so one propanol means that this functional group right here, the alcohol functional group, is attached to the first carbon. Okay? Another way to write this, uh, and this is like a structural formula. This is a, I think, it, uh, what's it called? It, it, different textbooks call it different things. I think this is the condensed, um, condensed formula or whatever. But this is CH3. So we have a carbon with three hydrogens on the end. Oops. Then a bonded to CH2. Bonded to CH2, that's these two parts here, and then bonded to OH, okay? The condensed formula. Um, you might even see it, you know, like this, without the lines in between, I think, so. Okay, they kind of mean the same thing. This gives us structure, and we'll need to use the structural diagram for some of the other isomers, but for right now, this just tells you kind of what, what it's attached to. Yeah, was there a question back there? Okay, so 2-propanol, for example, 2-propanol would mean that this alcohol group is attached to not the first one, but the second, okay, the second carbon. 
So I don't know if I have 2-propanol as the next example here. Nope. Okay, but let me, let's draw that here for you. So 2-propanol, 2-propanol. Uh, in between numbers and letters, we're going to put dashes, okay, uh, in naming organic <laughs> compounds. So 2-propanol, okay, so meth, eth, Probe. First of all, that's where we're going there. Meth, eth, prop, right? Remember, we have to memorize those. Meth, eth, prop, but. The prop is three carbons. The second, now this is the all, the functional group is on the second carbon. If it was a bond, it would be the second bond position. If it's referring to this, then it's the two for the alcohol group. So it would look something like this. On the second carbon, you would have OH here. Okay? And then you'd have. Uh, hydrogens would fill in the rest of the four bond positions for carbon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All refers to an alcohol functional group. Um, but we're just focused on isomers right now. We're not focused on learning the functional groups yet. So, uh, like I say, this is just an example to explain sort of how we identify the isomers. But yeah, we'll talk more about the alcohol uh, functional group and alcoholic uh, organic compounds uh, for sure. We'll talk about that later. All right. Okay, good job. Good questions. Okay, geometric isomers. Geometric. So geometric, um, you know, geometry is sort of the, you know, the shape, right? The shape. Uh, geometry. So geometric isomers. This is a category of stereoisomers. Now the stereoisomers would, um, uh, stereoisomers are the same formula, but different structure, really. Um, there's, there's, We'll talk a little more about that later maybe, but stereoisomers, they're basically uh, the same structure, different, uh, uh, different position, uh, different, same formula, different structure, resulting from different arrangements of groups around a double bond. So geometric isomers are the arrangements of groups around a double bond, okay? The difference in geometry affects the isomer's physical properties. So if you think about the actual structure of something, how it interacts with other uh, chemicals and other molecules is altered. And so uh, the different geometry does affect its physical properties, melting and boiling points, and also you know, reactivity. If we're talking about biology, we're talking about, um, uh, um, well, well, we'll talk about that later. Hope we'll talk about it later. They also differ in chemical properties, as I mentioned. Um, some geometric isomers, which are drugs, have different effects depending on whether they are cis or trans isomer. So we're going to talk about cis butene and trans butene. So cis is the word for meaning uh, same. Trans is the word for the uh, sort of the, the prefix here for meaning uh, opposite. Okay. So cis comes from the Latin meaning the same side. Trans comes from the Latin meaning across from or opposite side of. And this diagram right here gives us an excellent view, both three-dimensionally and structurally, on how these two isomers are arranged. So the double bond, in order to understand this well, what we have to understand are the differences between how the double bond and the single bond uh, how those actually work out in, in the uh, rotation of a molecule. So think about it this way, okay? Uh, think about it this way. Okay, so remember that you can draw it this way as well. The double bond, the carbons can extend both up from the, the carbon here across the double bond, or they can extend in opposite directions. So cis and uh, trans, okay? So remember, single bond is free to rotate. Double bond is rigid. It is not free to rotate. It can twist, but it cannot rotate. So a double bond is either this or this. Okay? That's what the difference is. Okay? So you just remember this one, uh, and uh, that's really important. Okay, optical isomers. We're going to talk about optical isomers as well. And optical isomers are maybe a little bit trickier to understand because... Uh, it's, it's really helpful to, to see this in three-dimensional space, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and help you. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll get the uh, molecular model kits out here as well, so you can kind of see this. We're going to make some molecules as a bit of a lab here coming up, and you'll be able to see some of these in 3D space uh, as well coming up shortly. But optical isomers. Okay, optical is sort of visual. 
right, as we think of optics, visual. This is another category of stereoisomers that result from different arrangements. I'll zoom in a bit here again. Uh, result from different arrangements of four, oh, my, of, of four different groups around the same carbon atom. I cannot. Okay. So we have a carbon atom in the middle, and if you have four different groups, and remember, these things are spaced out, um, they're spaced out in all directions, evenly spaced, and I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and set this up here for you, okay? So if we have these four pens, okay, and my, my hand here is the carbon, so here's one carbon, uh, attached to a hydrogen. Here's another uh, hydrogen here, and these are in the same plane, okay? Those are in the same plane. Now, really, in order for these to spread out properly, one would have to come out towards you guys, and one would have to come out back towards me. So that we kind of have this, and I'll try and do this best I can, but we have this sort of tetrahedral arrangement. You see that? No matter which way you flip it, it should be the, the same sort of orientation there, and everything is exactly the same distance apart from each other. So three-dimensional. Now what this is saying is that there is actually a different way these can be arranged. And yes, I can twist them around and you say, oh, that's different. No, it's not. That's not different either. This is not different. They are all arranged according to each other in the same way. But if I were to actually pluck this one and ex exchange it with this one, okay, we may have something very different. Because this, this, is, uh, this is now, um, you know, uh, it's, it's in a different arrangement around this, this carbon atom, okay? Or if we switch some things around. So how do, we, how do we see this? How do we see this? Well, two-dimensionally it's difficult, but I think it's actually easier with this two-dimensional sort of drawing. This is the three-dimensional here. So let's go alphabetical on the three-dimensional over here. Uh, let me get back to the screen. So three-dimensional over here. So X, Y... Right, we're going to start with W. W, X, Y, Z. Okay, so W to X, and then over here to Y, and then over here to Z. Over here, this one right here, look at how X and Y have switched around. So now we go W, and then all the way over here, X, then Y, then Z. Okay, so those are in different uh, arrangements. That's what an optical isomer means. They're in slightly different arrangements according to each other. Now, what I, how I like to teach this with uh, the two-dimensional here is literally this. W, X, Y, Z. So we go around in a circle here, two-dimensionally around in a circle. Okay. If you have to go, instead of going left or right, because notice, okay, notice this. If we're talking about three-dimensionally, I've just flipped this thing around backwards. I'm still going W, X, Y, Z. You see that? So this is not different. That's not, these two are not different. But this one is. And so if you have to go W and then across the carbon to get to the X, see how it's not next to it. As long as it's not next to it, like the other one was, then you have a different optical isomer. So you have to go across all the way to the other side first. W, X, and then Y, and then Z. Okay, instead of counting around, you count across. Those would, that's how you would represent an optical isomer. So the four groups can always be arranged in two different ways, no more than two, because we could flip all of these both back around and, and twist them around. But there is two different ways they could be arranged. These isomers end up being mirror images of each other, mirror images, just like your hand. Now, the reason why, okay, this is a mirror image now, minus the ring, that's a mirror image. So the reason why um, we have left-hand gloves and right-hand gloves, okay, that are different is because our hands are not identical. They're mirror images of each other, right? Mirror images of each other. And so uh, if you put a mirror in between my pinkies, they would be exactly the same, right? Mirror images. If I put one on the other opposite, they lay on each other. But both palms up, they do not match, right? Same thing for this, okay? So if they're both facing me this way, counting left from right with my palms facing me, it's thumb on the left. Here it's pinky on the left. 
So these would be other examples of optical isomers. Questions? All right. You guys are doing great. There's a lot of things just kind of we have to uh, learn. Here's some more on optical isomers. Uh, here's an example. It's probably where we'll close to being ending today. We'll finish this page. So in, 19, in 1848, Louis Pasteur discovered that crystals of tartaric acid existed in these two shapes that were mirror images of each other. Okay? So mirror images, tartaric acid. Because a person's hands are like mirror images, the crystals are called left-handed and right-handed forms. So again, with the, uh, with the hands example, we have a left-handed form and a right-handed form. The two forms had the same chemical properties, melting point, density, uh, solubility in water, but only the left-handed form was produced by fermentation to make wine. Also, bacteria were able to multiply only when they were fed the left-handed form as a nutrient. So there are some very um, specific differences between left-handed and right-handed um, stereoisomers or optical isomers. Today, these two forms are called D-tartaric acid and L-tartaric acid. The letters D and L stand for the Latin prefixes dextro, meaning to the right, and levo, to the left. Now this is important, and this is where we'll end for today's lesson. The property in which a molecule exists in a right and left-handed form is called chirality. That word is chirality. It's not like chivalry. It's not a sh sound. It's a k sound. Chirality. That is C-H-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y. Chirality. So if you have chiral forms of the same molecule, you have a left and a right-handed version, a mirror image, ver you have mirror image versions of the same molecule that have mostly the same properties, but some very specific, slightly different poss uh, possibilities. And so it's interesting how in nature, um, even, even necessary for life, only one uh, chiral form is required for a lot of biological processes, which uh, leads us to, to, to really think about you know, the randomness uh, of how life could have existed. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of biological processes that need only one chiral. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, a little bit strange that you know, some of these things could have happened just by chance. Because when you think about the, the randomness of generation of these types of molecules, they would, one would expect them to randomly be generating both the left and the right. But we see only one hand form in some vital chemical processes. So this is very interesting. It's very interesting. OK, questions? All right, so, um, yeah, so for, let's go back to those questions. What page were those on here? Um, so you can focus on, oh, I've got to find them. Maybe I'm going back too far. Oh, right here. So these questions in your textbook, you can work on these ones, please. Uh, these will uh, solidify some of the uh, teaching that we taught in the last couple of days here. So page 778, I'll leave that up. And um, that concludes the teaching for this day.